Ladies and gentlemen, hello and welcome to Hot Technologies of 2016. Today we've got the power of suggestion, how a data catalog empowers analysts. I am your host, Rebecca Joslick, filling in for our usual host, Eric Cavanaugh, today while he is traveling the world. So thank you for joining us. Uh, this year is hot. It's not just hot in Texas where I am, but it's hot all over the place. There is an explosion of all kinds of new technologies coming out. We've got IoT, streaming data, cloud adoption, Hadoop continues to mature and be adopted. We have automation, machine learning, and all this stuff is, of course, underlined by data. And enterprises are becoming more and more data-driven by the day. And of course, the, the point of that is to lead to knowledge and discovery and you know, make better decisions. But to really get the most value from data, it's got to be easy to get to. You know, if you keep it locked away or buried or in the brain of a few people within the enterprise, it's not going to do much good for the enterprise as a whole. And I was kind of thinking about, you know, about data cataloging and thinking, of course, of, of libraries where, you know, long ago, that's where you went if you needed to find something out, if you needed to research a topic or look up some information, you went to the library. And of course, you went to the card catalog or the crabby lady who worked there. But, you know, it, it was also fun to kind of wander around if you just wanted to look. And sure, you might discover something neat. You might just find out some interesting facts that you didn't know. But if you really needed to find something out and you knew what you were looking for, you needed the card catalog. And of course, the enterprise equivalent is a data catalog, which can help shine light on all the data, allow users to enrich, discover, share, consume, and, and really help people get to data faster and easier. And so today, we've got Des Blanchfield, our own data scientist, and we have Dr. Robin Bloor, our own chief analyst. We've got David Crawford from Alation, who is going to talk about his company's data cataloging story, but first, we're going to lead off with Des. Des, I'm passing the ball to you, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Thanks for having me today. So this is an area I'm extremely uh, interested in because uh, uh, almost every organization I come across uh, in my day-to-day -day work, I find exactly the same issue that we um, spoke very uh, briefly about in the pre-show banter, and that is that uh, most organizations who have been in business for more than a few years have a plethora of data uh, buried around the organization in different formats. And, and in fact, I have clients that have data sets that go back to Lotus Notes databases that are still running in some cases as their pseudo intranet. And they always run into this challenge of actually finding where that data is and how to get access to it, who to provide access to it, when to provide access to them. And, and how to just catalog it, how to get it to a place where everyone can, A, be aware of what's there and, and what's in it, and, and B, how to get access to it and, and use it. And um, one of the biggest challenges, of course, is finding it. Uh, the, the other big challenge is, um, is knowing what's in there and uh, how to access it. So I may well know that I've got dozens of databases, but I don't actually know what's in there or, or how to find out what's in there. And so invariably, as, as we were just covering now on the pre-show banter, you tend to walk around the office and ask questions and yell across the cubicle walls and try to figure it out. And uh, often my experience is you may even find that you're wandering off to the, uh, the front desk of the reception and asking if anyone knows who to go and talk to. And, and quite often it's not always the IT folk because uh, if they aren't aware of the data set because somebody's just created it. Uh, and it could be something simple as, a, you know, quite often we'll find a, a project of some sort that's standing up an IT environment and the, the project manager's used a, a spreadsheet of all things and, and it's got this massive amount of valuable information around assets and contacts and names. And unless you know of that project and you know of that person, uh, you, you just can't find that information. It's just not available and, and, and you've got to get hold of that original file. So. Uh, there's a phrase that's been bantered around uh, with regard to data, and, and I don't necessarily agree with it, but I think it's a cute little uh, throwaway, and that is that uh, there's a certain number of people who think that data is a new oil, <clears throat> um, and I'm sure we're going to cover that in, in some uh, aspects as well later today. Uh, but what I have noticed, uh, and I've certainly uh, I've been part of that um, transformation, is that organizations or businesses that have um, learned to value their data have gained significant advantage over their competitors. There was a 
uh, interesting paper by IBM about uh, five or six years ago, and they surveyed about uh, 4,000 companies here in Australia. Uh, and they took all the information, all the performance data, all the finance data, and put it together in, in a boiling pot and fed it to the Australian School of Economics. And, uh, and they actually found a, a common thread here, and that was that companies who leverage technology uh, invariably gain such a competitive advantage over their uh, uh, peers and, and, and competitors per se that their, their competitors almost never catch up. And I think that's very much the case now uh, with data that uh, uh, we've seen this, this what people call a digital transformation uh, where uh, organizations that have, have clearly uh, figured out how to find data they've got, make that data available, and make it available in some very easy, consumable fashion to the organization without necessarily always knowing why the organization might need it, have gained significant advantage over the competitors. And I've, I've got a couple of examples on, on this uh, slide, which hopefully you can see. Um, now my one liner for this is that the large-scale disruption across almost every industry sector, uh, in my view, is being driven by data. And uh, you know, if the current trends are anything to go by, uh, my view is we've only really just gotten started. Uh, because when the long-standing brands uh, finally wake up to what this means um, and, and enter the game, they're going to enter the game in wholesale. When, when some of the major retailers uh, who have uh, uh, mountains of data start applying some historical analysis on the data, and if they even know it exists, uh, then some of the online players are going to get a bit of a wake-up call. But we're familiar with most of these brands. I mean, you know, we've got Uber, who are the largest taxi company in the world. They don't own any taxis. So what is it that makes them magic? Well, it's data. Uh, Airbnb, the largest accommodation provider. We've got WeChat, the largest phone company in the world, but they've got no actual infrastructure, no handsets, no phone lines. Uh, you know, Alibaba, the largest uh, retailer on the planet, but they don't own any of the inventory. Facebook, the largest media company in the world. I think last count they have 1.4 billion active daily users now, which is the, you know, it's a mind-boggling number. It's, it's sort of anywhere near, uh, I think someone claimed it like fifth or a quarter of the planet uh, is actually on there every day. And yet here's a content provider that actually doesn't create the content. All the data they serve is, is not created by them. It's created by their subscribers. And we all know these models. Uh, you know, Society One, which you may or may not have heard of, it's, it's a local brand, I think, uh, uh, in, in Commonwealth countries, it's a bank that actually uh, does peer-to-peer -peer lending. So in other words, it has no money. Um, all it does is manage the transactions and the data sets underneath those. Uh, Netflix, we're all very, very familiar with that. There's an interesting uh, one-liner here. When Netflix was uh, legally able to be used in Australia, when it was officially announced and you, could, you uh, didn't have to use a VPN to get to it, uh, as many people around the world tend to if you can't get to it in your local area. When Netflix was launched in Australia, it increased the international bandwidth on our internet links by 40%. So it almost doubled the internet usage in Australia overnight by just one application, one cloud-hosted application that does nothing but play with data. Um, it's just a mind-boggling statistic. And of course, you know, we're all familiar with Apple and Google, um, but these are the largest software vendors on the planet, yet they don't actually write the apps. So what's the consistent thing with all these organizations? Well, it's data, and they didn't get there because they didn't know where their data was and they didn't know how to catalog it. Um, so what we're finding now is that, that there's this whole new asset class referred to as data, and companies are waking up to it. Um, but they don't always have the tools and the, the, the know-how and the wherefore to, to map all that data, to catalog that data and, and, and make it available. But we have found that companies with almost no physical assets have gained high market value in record time via this new data asset class. Um, and, uh, and as I said, you know, some of the old players are now waking up to this and, and figuring it out. So I'm a big fan of taking folk on a bit of a journey. So you know, in, in um, uh, the 1800s, late 1800s, uh, and you'll be more than familiar with this in, in the US market, um, you know, it, it turned out that to run a, uh, a census uh, each year or so, I think they run them every 10 years at that point, but if you're going to run a census every year, it could take you up to eight or nine years to actually do the, the, the data analyses. Uh, and it turned out that the, that data set then got left in boxes and places in paper and, and, and almost no one could find it. And they just kept pumping out these reports. But the actual data was very hard to get to. Uh, we have um, a similar situation with another world uh, uh, significant moment around uh, the uh, 1940s sort of era with um, the Second World War. And uh, this thing is the, um, the, the Bletchley Park bomb, uh, spelled B-O-M-B-E. And it was a, a massive number crunching 
analytical tool that would go through uh, small data sets and find signals in it and um, be used to uh, to help crack codes for um, the Enigma. Um, and you know, this thing again was essentially uh, you know a device designed to ca not so much catalog but to to tag and, and map data and make it possible to take patterns and, and find it inside the data sets and in this case break codes, find keys and, and phrases and, and find them regularly in the, in the data set. And so we've been through this journey of, of finding things in data and, and, and leading towards cataloging data. And then these things came along, these massive low cost uh, racks of machines, just off the shelf machines. And we did some very interesting things with them. <laughs> Excuse me. And one of the things we did when was we, we built very low cost clusters that could, that could start indexing uh, the planet, and they, uh, you know, very famously, there's big brands uh, that have come and gone. That probably Google's uh, the, the most common home brand that we've all heard of. It's become a, an actual verb, uh, and you know you're successful when your brand has become a verb. But what Google taught us, uh, without realizing it, possibly in the business world, is that they were able to index the entire planet to a certain level, and 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 catalog the data that was around the world and make it available in a very easy, convenient form in a little tiny uh, one-line form on a web page with almost nothing on it. And you type in your query and it goes and finds it because they'd already crawled the planet, indexed it, and made it easily uh, available. Uh, and what we noticed was, well, hang on, we weren't doing this in organizations. Why is that? Why is it that we've got an organization that can map the entire planet and index it, crawl it, index it, make it available, and we can search for it and then click on things to go and find it? How come we haven't done that internally? Uh, and so there are lots of these little racks of machines around the world now that, that do that for intranets and find things, but they're still really just coming to grips with the idea of going beyond a traditional web page or a file server. And so we're sort of now entering this, you know, the next generation of data cataloging in many ways, and that is that, um, you know, discovering data assets via uh, post-it notes and water cooler conversations is not really an appropriate method for data discovery and cataloging anymore. And in fact, I don't think it ever really was. Um, and so we, we, we can no longer leave that whole challenge to, uh, to, to people just passing notes and posting notes and chatting about it. Uh, we're, we're well and truly beyond the era now where this next-gen uh, approach to data cataloging has come and gone and we have to get our, our arms around it. Um, if this was a, a, an easy issue, we would have already solved it uh, in many ways uh, earlier, but I think uh, it isn't an easy issue. Just uh, Indexing and crawling the data is only one part of it, knowing what's in the data and, and, and building some met metadata around what we discover, and then making it available in an easy consumable form, particularly for self-service and analytics. Uh, so it's still a, a problem being solved, but many of the parts of the puzzle, in my view, uh, are, are well and truly solved and available. Um, as we know, humans cataloging data is a recipe for failure. Um, uh, because human error is one of the uh, greatest nightmares we deal with in data processing. And, and, and I regularly talk about this topic where, uh, in my view, uh, humans filling in paper forms are probably the greatest nightmare we deal with in big data and analytics. They're constantly having to fix things that they do, even down to simple things like the dates in, in fields, people putting it in the wrong format. Um, but as I said, we've, we've seen internet search engines index the world every day, uh, so now we're, we're waking up to the idea that that can be done uh, on, on business data sets and, and the discovery process, uh, and, and, and tools and systems are now uh, readily available, as we're about to learn today. Um, so the trick, really, in my view, is uh, selecting the right tool or the best tool for the job, uh, and, and uh, more appropriately on top of that, finding the right partner to help you get started down this path. Uh, and I believe we're going to hear about that today, but before we do that, I'm going to pass over to uh, my uh, colleague, uh, Robin Bloor, and uh, hear his uh, take on the, the topic. Uh, Robin, uh, can I pass over to you? Yes, certainly can. Let's see if this works. Oh, oh yes, it does. Um, Okay, um, I'm coming from a different direction than Des, really, but I'll end up in the same place. Um, this is about connecting to data, so I just thought I'd walk through, you know, the reality of connecting to data um, point by point, really. Yeah, there's, there's a fact that data is more fragmented than it's ever been, and, you know, the the volume of data is growing phenomenally fine, but in in actual fact, the the different sources of data are also growing uh, at, at an incredible rate, um, and therefore data is becoming increasingly uh, increasingly fragmented all the time. Um, but because of um, analytics applications in particular, but they're not the only applications that care. 
we, we've got a really good reason to connect to all of this data. So we're stuck in um, we're stuck in a difficult place. We're stuck in a, a, a world of fragmented data, and there is opportunity in the data, uh, as Des was calling it, the new oil. Um, about data, well, it used to live on spinning disk, uh, either in file systems or databases. Now it lives in a much more varied um, environment. It lives in file systems, yes, but it also lives in Hadoop instances nowadays, or even Spark instances. It, it, it lives in multiple species of database. Not so long ago, we kind of standardized on relational database. Well, you know, that went out the window in the past five years because um, there is a need for document database and there's a need for graph database. So, you know, it, the, the game has changed. Um, so it, it lives on the spinning disk, but it now lives on SSD. Uh, and the latest uh, amount of SSD, I think the, the latest SSD unit is coming out from Samsung at 20 gigabytes, which is huge, you know? Um, and now it lives in memory. Um, in the sense that the prime copy of data can be in memory rather than on disk. We didn't used to build systems like that. We do now. Uh, and it lives in the cloud, um, which means it can live in any of these things in the cloud. You won't necessarily know where it is in the cloud. Um, you will only have its address. And um, just to ram home the point, Hadoop has so far failed as an extensible data store. We hoped it would become an extensible scale-out data store and it would just become one file system for everything and it would, you know, um, it, it would, rainbows would appear in the sky, basically, and unicorns would dance around. And none of that happened. Um, uh, which means we end up with the problem of data transport. And there is an, uh, uh, a necessity for data transport at times, but there's also a difficulty, you know. Um, data really does have gravity nowadays. You know, once you've got into the multi-terabytes of data, picking it up and throwing it around kind of causes um, latencies to appear on your network or to appear in various places. Um, and if you want to transport data around, timing is a factor. Um, there's nearly always nowadays some limit on how much time you've got to get one thing to uh, one data from one place to another place. There used to be what we used to think of as batch windows when the machine was kind of idle and no matter how much data you had, you could just throw it around uh, and it would all work out. Well, that's kind of gone. We're living in a much more in a real-time world. Uh, and therefore, timing is a factor as soon as you want to move data around. So if the data has gravity, you probably can't move it. Um, data management is a factor in the sense that actually you've got to manage all this data. You don't get that for free. Uh, and replication may be necessary in order to actually get uh, the data to do the job it's go it needs to do because it may not be wherever you've put it. It may not. It may not have sufficient resources in order to do the normal processing of the data. So data gets replicated, and data gets replicated more than you would imagine. I think the, um, somebody told me a long time ago that the average piece of data is replicated at least two and a half times. Um, uh, ESBs or Kafka present an option for data flow. Um, but nowadays it demands architecture. Nowadays you really need to think in one way or another uh, about what it actually means to throw the data about. Uh, and therefore to access data where it is is usually preferable as long as, of course, you can get the performance you need when you actually go for the data, and that depends on context. So it's a difficult situation anyway, you know. In terms of data queries, we used to be able to think in terms of SQL. Um, we, we can't really now. You know, um, different forms of query, SQL, yes, but JSON. Also, graph queries, Sparkle is only just one example of doing graph queries. Also, we need to do text search more than we ever did. Also, regex type searches, which is really complicated searches for patterns. And um, 
uh, genuine pattern matching, all of these things are actually bubbling up. Um, and all of them are useful because they get you what you're looking for, or they can get you what you're looking for. Um, queries nowadays span multiple data sources. They don't always do that, and often the performance is appalling if you do that. So it depends upon the circumstances. But people expect to be able to query data from multiple data sources. So data federation of one sort or another uh, is becoming more and more current. Data virtualization, which is a different way of doing it depending on performance, is also very common. Um, um, Data query is actually part of a process, not the whole process. Um, it's just worth pointing that out if you're actually looking at analytics performance. The, an, the actual analytics can take an awful lot longer than the data uh, gathering because that depends upon the circumstances. Um, but data query is an absolute necessity if you want to do any kind of analytics uh, on multiple data sources. I mean, just uh, you, you really actually. Um, uh, have to have capabilities that span. So about catalogs, um, catalogs exist for a reason. It's worth saying that you know, it, it's um, we have directories and we have schemas in databases and we have H catalog and Hadoop and we have wherever you go you will find in one um, place or another you will actually find that there is some kind of catalog. Um, and a unified global catalog is such a obviously good idea, you know, but very few companies have such a thing. Um, I do remember back in the year 2000, um, the year 2000 panic, I do remember that, that companies couldn't even pin down how many executables they had, never mind how many different data stores they had. Um, and it's probably the case now, you know, that most companies do not actively know in the global sense um, what data they've got. Um, but it's obviously it's becoming increasingly necessary to actually have a global catalog or at least to have a global picture of what's going on because of the growth of data sources and the continued growth of applications. And it's particularly necessary for analytics because you also, in one way, there's other issues here like lineage and provenance of the data. Um, and it's necessary for security in many many aspects of data governance. If you really don't know what data you've got, the idea that you're going to govern it is is just absurd. <coughs> um, so the net net, all data is catalogued in some way. It's just a fact. The question is whether the catalog is coherent and actually what you can do with it. Um, so I shall pass back to um, Rebecca. Okay, thanks, Robin. And uh, up next, we've got David Crawford from Alation. David, I'm going to go ahead and pass the ball to you, and you can take it away. Hey, thank you so much. Um, uh, and I really appreciate you guys having me on, on this show. Um, I think uh, I'm going to get this uh, started so that you can see the slides here. Um, so I think uh, I think my role here um, is to take some of that theory and see how it's actually being applied uh, and the results that we're able to drive at, uh, at real customers. Um, and so you can see a few on, on the, the slide. I want to talk about, about what uh, results we've been able to see in analytic productivity improvements, um, to sort of motivate the discussion, and we can talk about how they got there. Um, so I, I'm lucky to, to get to work pretty closely with a lot of really smart people at these customers. Um, and I just want to point out a few who have been able to actually measure and talk about how, uh, about how having a data catalog has impacted their analyst workflow. And just to briefly say at the front, I think one of the things that, that we're seeing change um, with, uh, with data catalogs versus kind of previous uh, metadata solutions, and one of the ways that the relation really thinks about the, 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 um, the solutions that we put together is to start from the analyst and work backwards to say, let's make this about enabling analyst productivity. Um, as opposed to just compliance or as opposed to just kind of uh, having an inventory, uh, we're making a tool that makes analysts more productive. And so when I talk to a data scientist uh, at financial services company Square, um, uh, there's a guy, Nick, who was telling us about how uh, his uh, he used to take several hours to find the right data set to start a, uh, to start a report. Um, now can do it in a matter of seconds using search. 
Um, at market share, uh, we talked to their CTO who, who kind of pulled his analysts who were using Square, uh, excuse me, using Alation, um, to find out what their what what benefits they saw, and they reported a 50% productivity boost. Um, and at the uh, you know one of the world's top retailers, eBay, they've got uh, over a thousand people who are doing SQL analysis um, on a regular basis. And uh, uh, I work pretty closely with uh, Deb Sage over there, who's a product manager in their data tools uh, 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 team. And she, uh, she found that when, when queriers adopt Alation, uh, adopt a catalog, they're seeing a, a double the speed in writing uh, new, new queries against the database. So these are real results. These are, these are people actually applying the catalog in their organization. Uh, and I want to kind of take you through what it takes to get set up, uh, kind of how a catalog gets established in a company. Um, and maybe the most important thing to say is that a lot of it happens automatically, right? So, so uh, Des talked about systems, learning about systems. Uh, and that's exactly what sort of a modern data catalog does. So they install Alation in their data center, and then they connect it to, a ver uh, to various sources of metadata in their, um, in their data environment. Uh, I'll focus in a little bit on the databases and the BI tools. Um, for, from both of these, they're going to extract technical metadata about basically what exists, right? So what tables, what, what reports, uh, what are the report definitions? So they extract that technical metadata and there be a catalog page is automatically created for every object inside of those systems. Um, and then uh, there's a, they also extract uh, and layer on top of that technical metadata, they layer on top the usage data. Um, and that's primarily done by um, reading query logs from the database. And this is a really interesting source of information. So, you know, whenever an analyst writes a query, whenever a reporting tool, uh, whether it's homegrown or, or off the shelf, when a reporting tool runs a query in order to update a dashboard, when an application runs a query to insert data or to, to operate on, on a data set, all of those things are captured in database query logs. Whether you, whether you have a catalog uh, or not, sorry, they're, they're captured in the query logs of the database. And what a data catalog can do, and especially what, what the Alation's catalog can do, is read those logs, parse the queries inside of them, and um, create a, a really interesting um, kind of usage graph uh, based on those logs. And we bring that into play to inform future users of the data about how past users of the data have used it. Um, so um, we bring all of that knowledge together into a catalog, and just to kind of make this real, um, these are the integrations that are already deployed at customers. Um, so, you know, we've seen Oracle, Teradata, Redshift, Vertica, and a bunch of other uh, uh, relational databases. In the Hadoop world, um, there's a, a range of SQL on Hadoop uh, sort of relational meta stores on top of the Hadoop file system, Impala, Tez, Presto, and Hive. Uh, we've also seen success with um, cloud Hadoop providers like Altascale. And we've also uh, been able to, to uh, connect to Tableau servers, MicroStrategy servers, and index the, the, uh, the dashboards there, as well as, as uh, integrations with um, sort of the data science uh, charting tools like Plotly. Um, so, you know, we, we connect to all of these systems, we've connected these systems to customers, we pull in the, the technical metadata, we pull in the usage data, and we sort of automatically prime the data catalog. Um, but just, and, and, and in that way we centralize the knowledge, but just centralizing things into a data catalog doesn't by itself um, provide those kind of, those really wonderful productivity boosts that we talked about with the eBay, Square, and market share. Um, in order to do that, we actually needed to change the way that we think about uh, delivering knowledge to analysts. Uh, and one of the questions um, that they asked me to prepare for this was, how, how does a catalog actually impact an analyst's workflow, right? And that's kind of what we spend all day thinking about. And in order to talk about this change in thinking uh, of a push versus a pull model, um, I wanted to make a quick analogy to what the world is like before and after reading on a Kindle. And so it's just an experience some of you might have. You know, when you're reading a physical book, you come across a word, you're not sure you, you know that word's definition super well. You can maybe guess it from context. Not that likely that you're gonna get up off the couch, walk to your bookshelf, 
find your dictionary, dust it off, and, and flip to the right place in the, the alphabetical listing of words to make sure that you, you know, yes, you had that definition just right and you know the nuances of it. So it doesn't really happen. But you, you buy a Kindle or you get the Kindle app and you start to, um, to read books there and you see a word you're not totally sure about and you touch the word. All of a sudden, right in that same screen is the dictionary definition of the word um, with all of its nuances, different ex you know, example usages, um, and uh, you swipe a little bit and you get a, a Wikipedia uh, article on that uh, topic. You swipe again, you get a translation tool that can translate it from into other languages or from other languages. Um, and all of a sudden, your, your knowledge of the language is that much richer. And it just happens uh, an astounding number of times compared to when you had to go pull that resource for yourself. And so what I'm going to argue is that the workflow for an analyst and the way that an analyst will deal with data documentation is actually very similar to how a reader will, will interact with the dictionary, whether a physical one or through the Kindle. Uh, and so, so what we, the way that we really saw those productivity boosts is not just building the catalog, but connecting it to the workflow of the analyst. And so uh, they've asked me to do a, a demo here, and I want to make that the, the focus of this presentation. Um, but I just want to set up the context for the demo. Um, when we think about pushing uh, the data knowledge to the, 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 to the users when they need it, uh, we think the right place to do that, the place where they spend their time, where they're doing the analysis, is a SQL query tool, right? A place where you write and run SQL queries. Uh, and so we built one, and we built it, and the thing that's really uh, uh, different about it from other query tools is its deep integration with the data catalog. Um, so our query tool is called Alation Compose. It's a web-based query tool, and I'll show it to you in a second. Uh, web-based query tool that works across all of those, those database logos that you saw on the, on the previous slide. Um, so uh, what I'm going to try to demo is the way, in particular, the, the way that um, the, the catalog information comes to users, and it does it through these kind of three different ways. So it does do it through interventions, and that's where somebody who's a, a data governor or a data steward or an, a, sort of an administrator of some way or a manager can say, I want to sort of interject with a, a note or a warning in the workflow and make sure that it's delivered to users at the right time. So that's an intervention, and we'll show that. Um, smart suggestions is a way where the tool uses all of its aggregated knowledge of the catalog to suggest objects and, um, and parts of a query as you're writing it. Uh, and the, kind of the most important thing to know there is that it really takes advantage of the query log um, to do that, both to suggest things based on usage and also to find even parts of queries that have been written before, and we'll show that. And then previews. Previews are as you're typing in the name of an object, we show you everything that the catalog knows, or at least the most relevant things that the catalog knows about that object. So samples of the data, who has used it before, the, um, the, the logical name and description of, uh, of that object uh, all come up to you while you're writing it without having to go ask for it, right? So uh, without any more talking, I'll get to the demo. And I'm just going to wait for it to appear. Um, what I'm going to show you here is the um, is the the uh, the query tool. It's a dedicated SQL writing interface. It's a separate interface from the catalog. So in a certain sense, you know, um, Des and Robin talked about about uh, the catalog, and I'm jumping a little bit over the catalog interface straight to how it's brought directly into um, uh, into service the uh, the workflow. So I'm just showing here a place where I can I can type uh, SQL, and at the bottom you'll see um, that we sort of have some information appearing about uh, the objects that we're referencing. So I'm going to just start typing a query, and I'll stop when I get to one of these interventions. So I'll type select, um, and I want the year. I want uh, the name, and I'm going to. Uh, to look up a, some salary data. So this is an education data set. It has information about higher education um, institutions. And I'm, I'm looking at the, the sort of average faculty salaries in one of these uh, tables. 
So I've typed the columns. Uh, I've actually typed the word salary. Um, it's not exactly in the, in the name of the column that way. We use both the logical metadata and the physical metadata to do suggestions. Um, and what I want to point out here is this sort of yellow box that's appearing here that says that there's a warning on this column. Um, so that uh, I didn't go looking for that. I didn't take a class on on you know how to use this data properly. It came to me, and it's uh, it happens to be a warning um, about a confidentiality agreement uh, that has to do with this data. So there are some disclosure rules. If I'm going to query this data, I'm going to take result take data out of this table. I should be careful about how I disclose it. So you have a governance policy here. Um, there's some compliance uh, challenges. It makes it so much easier for me to comply with this policy when I know about it at the time that I'm looking at the data. So I've got that coming up to me, and then uh, I'm also going to look at uh, tuition. And here we see the previews come into play. So on this um, tuition uh, uh, column, I see, uh, let's see, I actually want, uh, yeah. So okay. So there's a there's a tuition column on the institution table, um, and uh, I'm seeing a, a a profile of that. So Alation goes and and pulls sample uh, data from the tables, and in this case, uh, it's showing me you know something that's pretty interesting. It's showing me a distribution of the values, and it's showing me that the zero value showed up um, 45 times in the sample, right? And and more than any other value. So I've got some sense that we might be missing some data, right? Now, if I'm, if I'm an advanced analyst, then this might be part of my, my workflow already, especially if I'm a particularly meticulous one, where I would do a bunch of uh, profiling queries ahead of time. Whenever I'm approaching a new piece of data, I always think about what our data coverage is. But if I'm new to data analysis, if I'm new to this data set, I might assume that if there's a column, it's filled in all the time. Or I might assume that if it's not filled in, it's not zero, it's like null or something like that. But in this case, we have a lot of zeros. And if I did an average, it would probably be wrong, right? So if I, if I just uh, assumed that those zeros were actually zero instead of missing data. But uh, Alation, by bringing this preview into your workflow, kind of uh, asks you to take a look at this information and gives, gives even uh, sort of novice uh, analysts the chance to see that there's something to, to notice here about that data. So we have that preview. Uh, so the next thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to try to uh, find out what tables to get this information from. And so here we see the smart suggestion. It's been going all the time, but in particular here, I haven't even typed anything, but it's going to suggest to me which tables I might want to be using for this query. Uh, and the most important thing to know about this is that it takes advantage of, of the, uh, the usage stats. So in, a, in a, an environment like, for instance, eBay's, where you have hundreds of thousands of tables in a single database, um, having, a, having a tool that, that can sort of get the wheat from the chaff and using those usage stats is really important for making these suggestions worth, worth something. So it's going to suggest this table. Um, when I look at the preview, we actually uh, highlight the three, three of the columns that I have um, mentioned already in my query. And um, if I, uh, so I, I know that it's got three, but it doesn't have the name. Uh, so I need to get the name, so I'm going to do a join. And uh, when I do a join, now again, I have these previews to help me find like, where is the, uh, is the table with the name. And uh, so I see that this one has a nicely formatted, kind of properly capitalized name. It seems to have one, one row with, with a name for each, each institution. So I'm going to grab that. And now I need a join uh, condition. And so here what, uh, what Alicia is doing is, again, looking back at the query logs, seeing previous times that these two tables have been joined, and suggesting different ways to join them. Um, and sort of once again, there's an intervention. If I look at one of these, um, it's got a warning that shows me that uh, this should only be used for aggregate analysis. It'll probably produce the wrong thing if you're trying to do something sort of institution by institution. Um, whereas this one uh, with the uh, OPE ID is uh, endorsed as the proper way of using, of joining these two tables if you want uh, a university level data. So, I do that, 
and it's a short query, but I've, I've written my query without really necessarily having any insight into what the data is. I've never actually looked at an ER diagram of this, uh, of this data set, um, but I know quite a lot about this data already because the, the relevant information is coming to me. So that's, the, those are the kind of the three ways that um, a catalog can, through, through an integrated query tool, can directly impact the workflow as you're writing queries. Um, and, but one of the other benefits of having a query tool integrated with a catalog is that uh, when I finish my query and I, I save it, I can put a, t a title like institution tuition and faculty salary. Um, and then I have a button here that allows me to just publish it to the catalog. And so it becomes very easy for me to feed this, uh, this back in. It, even if I don't publish it, uh, it's being captured as part of the query log, but when I publish it, it actually becomes part of, uh, of the, the sort of the way that the centralized place of, that all data knowledge is, is living. So if I click search for all queries in relation, I'm going to be taken, and here you'll see sort of more of the catalog interface. Um, I'm taken to a dedicated query search that shows me a way to kind of find queries across the entire organization. And you see that my newly published query is at the top. And uh, something to notice here is that, you know, as we capture the queries, we also capture the authors and we sort of establish this relationship between me as an author and these, these sort of data objects that I now know something about. Um, and I'm being established as an expert on this query and on these, and on these, uh, these data objects. So um, that's really helpful when people need to go learn about data that they can find the right person to go learn about. And if I'm actually new uh, to data, you know, whether I'm an advanced analyst, if as an advanced analyst I might look at this, uh, at this and, and see a bunch of examples that would get me started on a new data set. As someone who, who might not be, uh, feel super savvy with SQL, I can find kind of pre-made queries that are, are reports that I can take advantage of. So here's one by Phil Mazinet about uh, median SAT scores. Uh, click on this and I get sort of a, a catalog page for the query itself talks about an, uh, an article that was written that, that references this query, so there's some documentation for me to read if I want to learn how to use it. Um, and I can open it up in the query tool by clicking the Compose button. Um, and I can just run it myself here without even editing it. And actually, uh, you get to see a little bit of our, our sort of lightweight reporting capabilities where uh, when you're writing a query, you can drop in a, uh, a template variable like this and it creates a simple way to, um, to create a form to uh, execute a query based on a, a couple of parameters. Um, so that's what I have for the demo. I'm going to switch back to, uh, to the slides and um, just to kind of recap, we showed how uh, an administrator, or a, gover a data governor, can intervene by placing warnings on objects that show up in the, uh, in the query tool, how Alation uses its knowledge of the uh, usage of data objects to do smart suggestions, uh, how it brings in um, profiling and other tips to improve the workflows of, uh, of analysts when they're touching particular objects, and how all of that kind of feeds back into the catalog when new queries are written. Um, obviously, I'm a, I'm a spokesperson on behalf of the company. I'm going to say lots of nice things about data catalogs. If you want to hear directly from one of our customers, um, Christy Allen at Safeway uh, runs a, a, a team of analysts and has a really cool story about a, a time when she needed to really beat the clock in order to deliver a marketing experiment um, and how her whole team used Delation to collaborate and, uh, and turn around really quickly on that project. Um, so you can follow this, uh, this link, this bit.ly link, to check that story out, or if you want to hear a little bit about how um, Alation could bring a data catalog into your organization, we are happy to set up a personalized demo. Thanks a lot. Well, thanks so much, David. I'm sure that uh, Des and Robin have a few questions before I turn over to the audience Q&A. Um, Des, you want to go first? Uh, absolutely. I'd I, I, I love the idea of this uh, concept of published uh, queries and, and linking it back to the, the source of the, the authoring and so forth. I've been a long time uh, a champion of this idea of an in-house app store and I think this is a really great foundation to, to build on that. 
I'm keen to kind of get some insight into some of the organisations that you're seeing doing this and, and some of the success stories that they might have had with this whole journey of not only leveraging your tool and, and platform to discover the data, but also then transform their, their internal cultural and behavioural uh, traits around now having this sort of this, this in-house app store that you sort of just demoed sort of concept where they can not only just find it, but they can actually start to build little communities within the, the, the keepers of that knowledge. Yeah, I think we've been surprised. Uh, I mean, we believe in the in the value of sharing queries, um, both from my past as a product manager in, in ad tech and, and from all the customers that we've talked to. Um, but I've still been surprised at how often it's one of the very first things that, that customers talk about as the value that they get out of Alation. Um, the, uh, I was doing a, a, uh, some user testing of the query tool um, at uh, one of our customers called invoice to go um, and they had a, a product manager who was relatively new who and they said you know um, he, he actually told me as during a, unprompted during the during the, the user test I actually wouldn't be writing SQL at all except that it's made easy by Alation. and of course as the PM I kind of go well, what do you mean how, how do we do that and uh, and he said, uh, well, really, it's just because I can log in and I can see all of these existing queries. Um, starting with a blank state, uh, slate with, with SQL is an incredibly hard thing to do. Um, but modifying an existing query where you can see the result that's put out and you can say, oh, I just need this extra column or I need to filter it to a particular range of, of dates, uh, that's a much easier thing to do. So we've seen, uh, yeah, we've seen kind of these ancillary roles like product managers, maybe folks um, in like sales ops who who start to pick up and who always wanted to learn SQL and start to pick it up by using this catalog. Um, I think we also have seen that that a lot of companies have tried to do uh, sort of open source, you know, have tried to build these kinds of things internally where they track the queries and make it available. And there's some some really kind of tricky design um, challenges to making them useful. Uh, when it, Facebook has had an internal tool that they called HiPal. Um, they sort of captured all the queries written on Hive. Um, but what you find out is that if, if you don't kind of uh, nudge the users in the right way, you just end up with a very long list of select statements. Um, and as a user who's trying to figure out if a query is useful to me or if it's any good, if I just go look through a long list of select statements, it'll take me a lot longer to get something out of value there than starting from scratch. So uh, we've thought pretty carefully about how to, how to make a query catalog that it, that brings the right stuff to the front and provides it in a useful way. The, I, you know, the, there's an interesting. Uh, I think we all go through this journey uh, from from sort of very young age through to sort of adulthood, in many ways, in a bunch of technologies. I mean, personally myself, I've gone through that very same journey with things like learning to cut code. Uh, you know, I, I would go through magazines and then books, and I would study to a certain level, and then I needed to go and actually get some more um, training and, and education on it. But invariably, I found that even when I was going from teaching myself and reading magazines and reading books and copying other people's programs and then going to courses on it, I still ended up learning as much from doing the courses as I did to talking to other people who had some experience. And I think that, um, you know, it's an interesting uh, discovery that, you know, now that you, you bring that to the data analytics, um, that we're, we're basically seeing that same parallel that uh, human beings are invariably quite smart. Um, the other, other thing I'm really keen to understand is, um, at a very high level, the, the kind of, uh, many organizations are going to ask, uh, you know, how long does it take to get to that point? What's, what's the sort of tipping point time frame wise when people get your platform installed and they start to, to discover the types of tools? How quickly are people sort of seeing this thing turn into an, a really immediate aha moment where they, they realize they're not even worrying about the ROI anymore because it's there, but now they're actually changing the way they do business? Uh, and, and that they, they discover a little starter and they, they figure out they can do something really, really fun with it. Yeah, I can, how, how I can touch take? on it a little bit. I think that, that um, uh, you know, when, when we get installed, I think one of the, the nice things, one of the things that people like about a catalog that is directly connected into the data systems is that um, you don't start blank where you have to kind of fill it in page by page. And this was kind of true of previous metadata solutions where You'd start with a, an empty, an empty tool, and you have to start creating a page for everything that you want to document. Since we document so many things automatically by extracting the metadata, um, essentially within within a few days of having the the software installed, you can have 
a picture of your data environment that's, you know, at least 80% there um, in the tool. And then um, I think as soon as people start writing queries with the tool, they, they're they saved automatically back into the, into the catalog, and so those start to show up as well. So I think that we've definitely, you know, I, I don't want to be sort of like over, uh, eager in stating it, I, I think I think two weeks is a pretty good conservative estimate to a month. Two weeks to a month conservative estimate of of, of really turning around and feeling like you're getting value out of it, like um, uh, like you're starting to share some knowledge and, and being able to go there and find out things about your data. Yeah, it's it's quite astonishing, really, when you think about the fact that uh, some of the large data platforms that uh, you're effectively indexing and cataloging take sometimes years to, to implement and deploy and stand up properly. So the other, the, the last question I've got for you before I hand over to uh, Dr. Robin Bloor is, is connected. So um, one of the, the things that immediately jumps out at me is you've obviously got that whole challenge sorted out. Um, so there's a couple of questions just really quickly into one. Uh, how rapidly do connectors get implemented? Uh, obviously you start with the biggest platforms like the Oracle and the Teradata and so forth and DB2s, but uh, how regularly are, seeing, are you seeing new connectors come through and, and what sort of turnaround time do they take? I imagine you have a standard framework for them. <clears throat> and how deep do you go into those? So, you know, for example, the Oracles and, and the IBMs of the world and even Teradata uh, and then some of the more um, popular of late open source platforms, are they working directly with you? Are you discovering that yourselves? Do you have to have inside knowledge on those platforms? Uh, what does it look like to sort of develop a connector and how deep do you get sort of involved in those partnerships to, to ensure those connectors are discovering everything you possibly can? Yeah, sure. It's a, it's a great question. I think that um, most, to the, for the most part, we can develop the connectors, and we certainly did when we were when we were a younger startup um, uh, and had no customers. You know, we, we can develop the, the connections without needing any internal, certainly without needing any internal access. We never get any special access to the data systems that other that, that aren't publicly available um, and often without needing without needing a, a, a clip you know any inside information um, we, we take advantage of the metadata services available by the, the, the data systems themselves um, often those can be pretty complex and hard to work with uh, I know SQL server in particular the way that they manage the query log is you know there, there are several different configurations and it's it's a um, it's something that you really have to to work. Uh, you have to understand the nuances and the, the knobs and, and dials on it to to set it up properly. Um, and so that's something that we work with customers on uh, since we've done it several times before. To so but but to a certain extent, it's kind of public APIs that are, that are available or public interfaces that are available that we leverage. We do have partnerships with several of these companies. Um, and that's mostly around sort of certification so that they feel comfortable saying that we work. Um, and, uh, and also they, they can provide us sort of uh, resources for testing, sometimes early access maybe to a, a platform that's coming out to make sure that we, uh, we work on the new versions. Um, to turn around a new connection, I would, I would say, again, kind of to be conservative, um, let's say six weeks to, to two months. Um, it depends on how, how, how similar it is. So some of the, the Postgres forks kind of look very similar to Redshift. And so, you know, Redshift and Vertica share a lot of their, uh, their details. Um, so we can, we can take advantage of those things. Um, but uh, yeah, six weeks to two months would be fair. Uh, we also have APIs so that, uh, you know, we, we, we think of Alation as a metadata platform as well. Um, so if anything's not, not uh, available for us to, to reach and automatically grab, there are ways that you can write the connector yourself and push it into our system so that everything still gets centralized in a single search engine. Fantastic, I appreciate that. So we're going to hand over to Robin because uh, I'm sure he's got a plethora of questions as well. Robin. Robin may be on Have mute. Have you got yourself on mute? Hey, so, yeah, right. Sorry, I unmuted myself. Um, when you get, um, when you implement this, what's the process? I'm kind of curious because, you know, there can be a lot of data in a lot of places. So how does that work? Yeah, sure. Um, 
So we we uh, we go in. You know, first there's sort of an IT process of making sure a server is provisioned, making sure that network connections are are available. You know, that the ports are open so that we can actually access those systems. Uh, certainly, they all often know where which systems they want to start with. Now, knowing inside of a of a data system, you know, which um, and, and sometimes it actually will help them. We'll help them go do an initial look at their query log to understand who's using what, right, and how many users they have on a system. So we'll help, we'll help um, uh, find out where the, they often, if they've got hundreds or thousands of people who might be logging into databases, they actually don't know where they're logging in. So we can go find out from the query logs, uh, you know, how many unique user accounts do you have uh, actually logging in and executing queries here in a month or so. So we can take advantage of that, um, but often they'll know the most important ones. Um, we get them set up, and then there's a there's a process of saying, okay, let's prioritize. Um, there's a, there's sort of a range of activities that can happen in parallel. There's I, I, I would focus in on two on the, the training for using the query tool, where you know once people start using the query tool, first of all, uh, a lot of people love the fact that it's just a single interface to all of their different systems. Uh, they also love the fact that it's web-based, doesn't involve any installs if they don't want to. Um, from a security standpoint, they like having sort of a single entry point uh, from a network standpoint between sort of the corp IT network and the, the data the, the data center where the, the uh, production data sources live. Um, and so they'll, uh, they'll sort of set up Alation as a query tool and, and start to use Compose as a point of access for all of these systems. So once that happens, you know, what we focus in there is on, on training, is understanding what, it, you know, what are some of the differences between a web-based or a server-based query tool versus one you'd have on your desktop and, uh, and some of the nuances of using that. Um, and then at the same time, what we'll try to do is identify the most valuable data, again, taking advantage of the query log information and saying, hey, you might want to go in and help people understand these. Let's start adding, uh, let's start publishing representative queries on these, on these tables, right? That's sometimes the most effective way to very quickly get people spun up. Let's look at your own query history, publish these things uh, so that they show up as the first queries. When people look at a table page, they can see all queries that touch that table um, and they can start from there. And then let's start adding titles and descriptions to these objects so that they're easier to find in search, um, so that you know some of the nuances of, of how to use it. Um, we make sure that we get a thorough look at the query log so that we can generate lineage. Uh, one of the things we do is we look through the query log at times when data moves from one table to another. Um, and that allows us to, you know, to put one of the most frequently asked questions about a table of data is, where did this come from? How do I trust it? And so what we can show is not only which other tables it came from, but how it was transformed along the way. And again, this is kind of powered by the query log. So we make sure that those things are set up and that we're getting lineage into the system. And we're sort of targeting the most highly valuable uh, and the most sort of highly leveraged pieces of metadata that we can get um, established on, a, uh, on the table pages so that uh, when you search, you find something useful. Okay, the, the other question, because there's a lot of questions from the audience, so I don't want to take up too much of the time here. Um, the other question kind of comes to mind is just the um, the, the pain points. Um, a lot of software is bought because people are, um, uh, are, in one way or another, having difficulties with something. So what's the common pain point that leads people to elation? Yeah, um, I think there are a few, but I think the, the uh, one of the ones that we hear pretty often is analyst onboarding. I know I'm going to need to hire, um, you know, 10, 20, 30 people uh, in the near term who are going to have to produce new insights uh, from this data. How are they going to get up to speed? So analyst onboarding is something we certainly tackle. There's also just relieving the, um, relieving the senior analysts from spending all of their time answering questions from other people about data. Uh, that's a very frequent one as well, uh, and both of those are essentially essentially education problems. Um, uh, and then I would say another place that we we see people adopting Alation is when they uh, when they want to set up a brand new uh, kind of data environment for someone to work in. You know, they want to kind of advertise and market this internally to new to people to take advantage of. Then making Alation sort of the front end to that new analytic environment is very appealing. 
it's got the documentation, it's, it's got a single point of, of uh, introduction to the, uh, a single point of access to the systems, um, and so that's another place where, where people will come to us. Okay, I'll pass you on to Rebecca because the, um, the audience is trying to get to you. Yes, we do have a lot of really good audience questions here. And David, this one was uh, posed specifically to you. It's by an attendee who apparently has some experience with people kind of misusing uh, queries. And, and he kind of says that the more we empower users, uh, the harder it is to govern responsible use of compute resources. So can you defend against the propagation of misguided but common query phrases? Yeah, um, yeah, I see this question. It's a great question. It's one we get, we only get pretty frequently. Uh, it's one I've seen the pain uh, myself at, at previous companies um, where you need to train users. For instance, this is a log table. It's got logs going back for years. If you're going to write a query about uh, on this table, you really have to limit um, limit it by date, right? So, for instance, that's a that's a training that I went through at a previous company to before I was given access to the database. Um, we have a couple of of ways that we try to address this. I would say that um, I think that query log data is is really uniquely valuable to address it. Um, it gives another insight versus kind of what the database does internally on query plan with its query planner. Um, and what, what we do um, is one of those interventions, we have the manual interventions that I showed, and that's useful, right? So you can put on a, uh, on a particular join, for instance, you can say, let's deprecate this, right? It'll have a big red flag when you start to, when it, when it shows up in Smart Suggest. Um, and so that's one way of sort of trying to get to people. Um, another thing that, uh, that we do is uh, automated um, sort of just, uh, I want to say, at, at execution time uh, interventions. And so that'll actually use the parse tree of the query before, you, before we run it to see does it include a certain filter. Uh, or sometimes a couple of other things that we do there as well. But but one of the most value ones and the simplest to explain is does it include a filter? So like that example I just gave of this log table, if you're going to query it, has to have a date range. Um, you can specify uh, in the in the table page there uh, that you mandate a particular filter to be that that date range filter to be applied. If someone tries to run a query that doesn't include that filter, it actually will stop, will stop them with a big warning and it will say, you should probably add this, some SQL that looks like this to your query, right? Now they can continue if they want, right? We're not going to actually uh, completely ban them from, from using it. It's a query tool. It's got to, at the end of the day, run queries. Um, but we, we put a pretty big barrier in front of them so, and we give them a suggestion, a, a concrete sort of actionable suggestion for a way to um, modify the query to improve the performance. Um, we actually also do that automatically in some cases, again, by observing the, the query log. If we see that some really large percentage of queries on this table take advantage of a particular um, uh, filter or a particular join clause, then we'll actually uh, pop that up. We'll kind of promote that to an, an intervention. Uh, actually, it happened to me on an internal data set. We have, we have customer data and we have user IDs. Um, but the user ID set, since it's it's kind of uh, we have user IDs at every customer, it's not unique. So you have to pair it with a client ID in order to get a unique join key. And I was writing a query and I tried to analyze something and it popped up and it said, "Hey, uh, everyone else seems to join these tables with both the client ID and the user ID. Are you sure you don't want to do that?" And it actually uh, stopped me from doing some incorrect analysis. Um, so it, it works for both the the accuracy of the analysis as well as the performance. Um, so, so that's kind of how we, we take that problem on. And that would seem to me to be a, a, an effective, though you said you won't necessarily block people from hogging up resources, but sort of teach them that what they're doing might not be the best, right? We always assume that the users are not malicious. <laughs> 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 we assume the best intent. Um, and, so, and we try to be pretty open in that way, yeah. Yeah. Okay, uh, here's another question. What's the difference? between a catalog manager, like, like with your solution, and an MDM tool, um, or, or does it actually rely on a different principle by widening the choice of the query tables, whereas MDM would do it automatically but with the same underlying principle of connecting metadata? 
Um, yeah, I think that uh, I mean, uh, I think that when I when I look at kind of traditional MDM solutions, the primary difference is a, is a philosophical one. It's all about who the user is. Um, uh, kind of like I said at the beginning of my presentation, Alation. I think when when we were founded, we we were founded with an, an aim to enable analysts to to do more, you know, to, to produce more insights, to produce them faster, to be more accurate in the insights that they produce. Um, I, I I don't think that you would, that that has been any has ever been the goal of a, of a traditional MDM solution. Those solutions tend to be targeted towards people who need to produce uh, reports of what data has been captured to the SEC or or uh, internally for some for some other kind of auditing purpose. Um, it can sometimes enable analysts, but it's more often, if it is going to enable a, a practitioner in their work, it's more likely to enable sort of a data architect or a, um, uh, uh, like a, a DBA. Um, but uh, uh, when, you know, when, when you think about things from the standpoint of an analyst, then that's when you start to, you know, build a query tool that's integrated into your catalog. That's not something that an MDM tool would ever do, right? Um, that's when you start to, um, to think about uh, performance as well as accuracy, as well as understanding how you know what data re relates to my my business need, um, all of those things are things that are kind of top in our minds when we design the tool, and uh, and it's, it goes into our search algorithms, it goes into the layout of the catalog pages, and the ability to easily kind of contribute knowledge from all around the organization. Uh, it goes into the fact that we built a query tool and that we we build the catalog directly into it. So. I think it really comes from that, you know, who, which, what user do you have first in mind? Okay, good. That, that, that really helped explain. And one attendee who was dying to get a hold of the archives because he had to leave, but he really wanted his question answered. Um, <laughs> but it, was, it was mentioned in the beginning that there are multiple languages, but is SQL the only language leveraged within the Compose component? Uh, yes, that's true. And you know, one of the things that that uh, I've noticed, even as I kind of witnessed the explosion of the the different types of databases, um, of document databases, of graph databases, of, of key value stores, is that they are really um, powerful for for um, application development. Uh, they can serve you know particular needs there really well, um, in better ways than than relational um, databases can. But that when you bring it back to Data analysis. When you bring it back to, um, when when you want to provide that information to people who are going to do ad hoc reporting or ad hoc uh, digging into the data, that they always come back to a relational, at least interface for the the humans, right? Um, and part of that is just because SQL is the lingua franca of data analysis. So that means it's for the humans. It's also for the for tools that integrate, right? Uh, I think this is the reason that I, you know, that that. Uh, SQL on Hadoop is so popular and there are so many uh, attempts at solving it is because at the end of the day, that's what people know. There, there are probably millions of people who know how to write SQL um, and, I, and I would venture not millions who know how to write a Mongo aggregation pipeline uh, framework query um, and that, uh, and that it's, it is a, a standard language that's used for integration across a, a really wide variety of platforms. So <laughs> all that is saying, We've never, you know, we're very seldom asked to go outside of it because this is the interface that most analysts use, um, and uh, it is a place where we focused, especially in Compose, uh, that we focused on writing SQL. I, I would say there's, the, I would say data science is the place where they meant they venture outside the most, um, and so we do get occasional questions about like Pig or SAS. Uh, these are things that we definitely don't handle in Compose. Um, uh, and that we would like to uh, to capture in the catalog, uh, and I'm seeing also R and and Python. Uh, it, we we have a couple of ways that we've kind of made interfaces that you can use use the queries written in Alation inside of R and Python scripts. So since often when you're a data scientist and you're working in in um, a scripting language, your source data is in a relational database. You start with a SQL query and then you process it further and create graphs inside of R and Python. And we've made a uh, we've made um, packages that you can import into those scripts that that pull the, the queries or the query results from Alation, so that you can kind of have a, a blended workflow there. 
Okay, great. And I, I know we've run a little bit past the top of the hour. I'm just going to ask one or two more questions. Um, I, I know you talked about um, all the different source systems that you can connect to, but as far as externally hosted data and internally hosted data, uh, can that together be, be searched into your, your single view, into your one platform? Um, sure, there are a few ways to do it. I mean, externally hosted, I would imagine, uh, I'm trying to think about exactly what that might mean, right? It could mean a database that someone is hosting in AWS for you. It could mean a public data source from data.gov. Um, we, uh, uh, we connect directly to databases by like logging in just like a, another application would with a, with a database account. Um, and that's how we extract the metadata. So if we have an account and we have a network port open, we can get to it. Um, and then when we don't have those things, we, we have something called a virtual data source that allows you to essentially uh, push documentation, uh, whether automatically by you know writing your own connector or um, uh, or by by filling it in, you know, by doing even like a CSV upload. Um, to to make sure you know to, to document the data alongside your internal data, um, so that gets all placed into the search engine. It, it becomes referenceable inside of uh, articles and other documentation and, and conversations inside the system. Uh, so that's how we handle there's you know when we can't uh, directly connect to a system. Okay, that makes sense. And I I'll just shoot out one more question to you. Where did one go? Um, one attendee is asking. How should the contents of a data catalog be validated, verified, or maintained as source data is updated, source tables modified, et cetera? Yeah, uh, it's a question we get a lot. And um, I think one of the things that we, we uh, uh, one of our philosophies, like I said, the users, we don't believe the users are malicious, right? We kind of assume that they are, are trying to contribute the best uh, knowledge. They're not gonna come in and deliberately mislead people about the data. Uh, if that is a problem at your organization, maybe Elysian is not the right tool for you. But for the, uh, but, but if you assume if you assume uh, uh, good intentions by the users, um, then what we think about it uh, as something where, you know, the the updates come in, and then usually there's what we do is we put like a steward in in charge of each uh, data object or each section of the data, and we can sort of notify those stewards. Um, when uh, when changes to the metadata are made, and they can sort of handle it in a in in that way. So they see updates come in, they validate them. If they're not if they're not right, they can go back and and modify and, and inform, and probably hopefully even reach out to the the user who contributed the information and help them learn. Uh, so that's the primary way we think about doing it. This sort of suggestion um, by the by the crowd and uh, and management by the, the stewards. Um, so we have some capabilities around that. Okay, good. And uh, if you could just let the folks know how they can best get started with Alation, um, and where can they go specifically to get more info? I know you shared that one. Bitly, is that the best place? Yeah, so the alation.com slash learn more, I think is a great way to go to go sign up for a demo. Um, the alation.com site has a, has a bunch of great uh, resources, uh, customer white papers, and uh, and and news about uh, about our solution. Um, so I think that's a great place to start. You can also email sales at alation com. Okay, great. And, and I know uh, attendees. Sorry if I didn't get to all of the questions today, but if not, they will be forwarded to David or his sales team or somebody at Alation, so they can definitely help answer your questions and and help understand you know what Alation does and what they do best. And with that, folks, I will go ahead and sign us off. You can always find the archive um, at insideanalysis.com. You can also find it at techopedia.com. They tend to update a little bit quicker, so definitely check that out. And thanks so much to David Crawford, Des Blanchfield, and Robin Bloor today. It's been a great webcast. Um, and with that, I'll bid you farewell. Thanks, folks. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.